Okay, fantastic. So we are going to start. We have uh, many attendees joining us, Dana. I want to start by saying hello to all of you. My name is Nahla Tabar. I'm one of the co-founders of Pursa School, which is an initiative that was put together as a collaborative a, as a collaborative effort by Sharjah Arts Foundation and NACT. It's an educational and professional program that's been designed to equip art practitioners and creative freelancers with the practical skills that we ultimately need to understand and navigate structural and institutional systems, specifically in the UAE art industry. The program itself has uh, is, is quite multifaceted in the sense that we have closed sessions, but a lot of sessions that have been designed to be available as public resources. And Dana, your session is one of them. So we approached Dana Nasif, who is an educator and a designer and a consultant who has been very much concerned with this idea of sort of um, educating in design in, in a way where maybe more formal structures have left out certain topics. So Dana has been a design lecturer at Dar al Hikma University in Jeddah, uh, as well as uh, joining the faculty of the College of Arts and Creative Enterprises at Zayed University in Dubai. And in addition to that, she is also pursuing a PhD in graphic design. And yes, so welcome Dana, what we, really wanted to talk to you about and why, why we were so keen to talk to you is actually, you know, the fact that you have been so active and shedding a lot of light on topics around design that are accessible, absolutely needed given this time. And in a sense, um, kind of uh, relevant to quite responsive to what has been going on particularly now. One thing that we want, we wanted to open up to our participants, but also the public, is this idea of what does it mean to be resilient at a time like this creatively, and what does that mean in terms of thinking outside of the box or our eco chamber of how we have been producing and how we have been working and 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 constructing our practice. Like, are there other avenues that we can explore that we haven't explored, and um, what does that mean? for us at a time like this. So Dana, happy for you to jump right in. If I've left anything out, please um, please let us know. And actually for, for the rest of the attendees, what, uh, what we would like you to do is hold off your questions until the end. What you can do is use the Q&A button that's on the right of your screen to supply Dana with questions, which she will address at the end of her presentation. All right. So hi everyone, and uh, my name is Dana. Um, Nahla introduced me better than I would have introduced myself, so I think we're good. Um, I basically practice graphic design, have been practicing it for a, num a many number of years, uh, but I also educate and do consulting. Um, and today's talk, I'm not gonna bore you with a lot of slides, and but I just wanted to give you something as an anchor to look at while I speak. Uh, I'm going to cover three main main points, uh, which is creative resilience and how I define it and how I apply it to my practice. Um, and I'm also going to talk about the different ways that you can productize your practice. And then I'm going to get into the fundamentals of pricing, which seems to be a really gray area. Uh, and there's a lot of talk about it, and it's not necessarily always clear. Um, in terms of what I do, just I, I basically specific, focus on graphic design and I just put some logos here because it's the easiest thing I can include, the smallest thing that fits in a slide. But I practice it, I teach it, and I some, most of the time actually, I consult clients on where they can go with it, with their um, um, uh, businesses or products or services from a graphic design perspective. So I come in as the graphic or the design consultant. Um, in terms of, now I, mean, I want to get straight into this so we can have room for questions at the end, uh, but mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about, I didn't coin this uh, term, I didn't invent it, but resilience, obviously it's extremely needed nowadays. Um, I'm not going to get in a lot into the pandemic and COVID because this discussion is really just going to bring us down, but it is necessary, it is an elephant in the room and we need to develop new ways of dealing with 
um, these changing times. So the way I see creative resilience and the way I define it is the ability to withstand the changes in life in general, but also in the industry, in the industry you're in specifically. Uh, and also it's the ability to build these traits that help you remain engaged and creative even when everything is working against it. But in addition to being engaged and creative, it's also to remain profitable and relevant um, because with all of these changing situations, a lot of things just go out of style. And I, I don't mean style in the, in, in the sense of style, but things go out of practice. Um, and it's important to stay relevant and to stay pro profitable as well. So what changed in our circumstances as creative practitioners? Everything has changed. And even if we are lucky or privileged to still have jobs or to still have a practice, many people do not have jobs or practices. Whatever they defined as their source of income or their source of originality and creativity is gone. Um, so if you are used to working and sharing your work in exhibitions or public events, that's most likely either diminished, gone, or extremely limited. If you're used to attending physical training sessions or classes if you're a student, an art student, that's changed. Now you're forced to do online learning, which is a fraction of the experience you get uh, when you're in actual when you're in the actual physical space. If you're a freelancer, a freelancer, um, a lot of work has dried up or some people have lost their jobs entirely. Or you're working from home and the setup is not supportive of your creativity or your um, previous routine. If you thrive on social interactions and that's what you're, where you get your energy from, again, that's almost gone or extremely limited. And isolation is tough on many people, even people who are comfortable with being alone. It's tough uh, when your routine is completely um, changed, basically. And then obviously our mental health is challenged with all of this uncertainty and the, this, there's no end in sight. So it's extremely difficult with all of these things that changed to remain creative, to remain engaged, to continue to work the way we do, um, sorry, to continue the work, to work the way we do. So I, I wanted to just quickly, and I'm not a mental health expert, obviously, but I just wanted to quickly just tap into the things that have helped me with staying engaged and creative and the things that help me stay um, as adaptable and as resilient as I can. Uh, and my top five tips are to always stay up to date with the changes in the market and the industry, especially at times like this, because if we're used to doing things a certain way, that certain way has changed completely. So I was extremely uncomfortable with online um, workshops or online anything or virtual anything. I have always preferred to stand there to, to basically feed off people in the room, to see their reactions, to under to see if they actually they're actually listening or enjoying, and, and that's how you know whether to move on to the next point or to stay at that point. But you can't do that these days. So I had to adjust and shift into whatever the market and the industry is using now in terms of um, tools and in terms of technology as well. Um, it's also very important to learn those new skills to stay relevant and competitive. Again, um, many of the skills that are needed now are not necessarily what was needed last year. So we need to always, and, and, and I'm obviously the examples I give, I'm are gonna be from my practice, but this is applicable to any practice, whatever it is, whatever it is that you need to know more about. So specifically with regards to this talk, if some of us are not comfortable with production or putting things together or pricing or the business aspect of doing things, that's something we need to learn because now we need to diversify and tap into new uh, routes that we haven't tapped into previously. Um, and also, I one thing I really, really, really recommend is to develop strategies to stay creative. I know we always think of creativity as this God-given um, state of mind. You're just creative or you're not. You wake up and you just feel inspired. And although some people are able to be like that, many are not. Many have strategies or routines in place to kind of like prep their brains to be creative and to produce. And I highly, highly recommend that you create a routine, uh, that you create a system. For example, my routine here is my daily morning walks. And it's no matter if, if it's raining, if it's windy, if it's sunny, if it's whatever, it's my way of telling my brain and my body that, okay, we're up, we're awake, we need to move a little, and then we get back, I get back to work. So whatever it is that you feel you can do, routines are extremely important. Um, also professional practice and environment uh, of, of the way you work. So 
I know we're home most of the time, so it's very hard. To, the line is blurred between work time and home time and pajama time and TV time because it's all in the same place. But it's very important to put these um, guides or basically lines between these these things, the things that you have to do. So whether it's in your work environment, you need to get a desk or you need to set up a place to be creative, even if it's like the smallest setup, like this is literally my work setup and it's this big <laughs> and I'm not exaggerating, but that's, that's my cue to just sit here and get work done. Uh, so I highly recommend professional practice and a professional routine. Um, and I know it goes against our idea of creativity because creativity is fluid and un, um, basically there are no boundaries, but but there are things that put you and set you in the right space mentally to start to be creative. Mm -hmm. um, and then also one thing that I really, really like, I feel like we, we were not taught or no one talks about it. And that's not just in the Arab or UAE, UAE culture. That's I think in the, the world in general and the creative culture as a whole, we never really are encouraged to explore the multifaceted uh, sides of ourselves. We're always either a visual artist or a graphic designer or an illustrator or a photographer. And there's a big move these days towards not necessarily putting yourself under one umbrella. And I highly, highly like, I recommend that we start to explore the different ways that we are creative and it doesn't necessarily have to be in the creative fields. So for example, you might have an interest in history and the arts or politics and the arts or poetry and the arts. I mean, poetry is similar, but, but it could be multidimensional and it doesn't have to, we don't have to force ourselves to fit in one box. I was watching a TED talk called why some people don't have a true calling. And it uh, basically discusses something that the, talk, uh, the speaker refers to as multi-potentialist. Um, and I started to think about all of these uh, personalities we know from history who are he's a philosopher and a historian and a, and a, um, a geologist and 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 but as we grew up we were taught to be like okay what are you gonna be or what are you gonna do and then when you go to school you have to pick a major and that major is very specific and when you start practicing you have to practice a, a certain thing so I think it's very important to just let loose of these boundaries and see where that takes you and that also goes back to being adaptable and resilient because you might be able to cover different categories and maybe the area you're in has been oversaturated, is no longer relevant. And then that allows you to tap into more areas and see where you can find yourself because it's not just one box that we have to fit into. So based on, so I always like, I always think revisiting your practice and developing ways to diversify it is very important, whether it's on you internally to look at what you're good at or what you like or externally, which brings me to my next point of um, how to diversify your practice specifically when it comes to um, productizing. I don't know if that's even a word, but like turning your practice into a product. And when I say product, um, a lot of people automatically assume that it's an, a tangible, sellable product, uh, it's a, a thing. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Regardless of your creative discipline, you can always find ways to adapt and change depending on the circumstances, either to increase your income, if that's a priority, or just to diversify your practice to remain competitive, to remain engaged, to remain creative. So even a financial gain or financial income is not necessarily the number one drive uh, for this diversification. It's all, always important to stay on top of your game. And I feel like that's one way of doing it. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about this picture here on the right, because it's... <laughs> Um, a failed story, but, but I'll get into it in a bit. But basically, there are two ways, in my opinion, to productize your practice. You can either turn your work into tangible products, sellable products, whatever it is that fits in your practice, or you can actually productize your service if you offer a service, and I'll get into that. Um, so for example, I'll use myself as an example, and you can apply that to what you do. So I am a designer by practice. So when I thought about, uh, this was in 2015, I wanted to create these calendars because I had the thing for calendars, but it came, it, I didn't have a client for it. It came from my personal interest or personal exploration, which is, I noticed that there's a lot of hate and negativity on Instagram. So, and there's a lot of, when you read the comments, there's a lot of 
unnecessary hate. So I thought I'd have a monthly um, don't hate message. Basically, every month you get a don't hate message. And these messages are relevant to what's happening in the world. So this was based in Saudi. So like, um, I think this was uh, in, in September, there was the national day. So it was don't hate celebrate or in another month, there was something else. So it's all, all relevant to these. And also the messages rhymed with don't hate. I don't, it, again, I'm not saying it's a good idea, but it, at the time it was something personal to me and I wanted to turn it into some a product. So I did, I turned it into a calendar. I priced it, I sold it. My mistakes with that was that I, my pricing was completely off. Um, and it didn't sell. So I'll get all, which is, I'll talk about more when we get into pricing. I completely got carried away with what I think is a nice product and what I think a nice product should be worth. And I didn't take into account that the market I'm selling it in does not necessarily see it the same way I do. Uh, but that's one example of turning my practice, my design practice into an actual product. Another way of doing it is turning my design service into a product. So I offer consulting and how do I productize consulting? It doesn't make sense. But I decided now, especially I just did this recently with the pandemic, that very few clients are going to spend on a full consulting package without knowing what they're getting or without knowing what you have to offer. So I decided to chop the big consulting package into smaller packages. And I offer something called road mapping. So that road mapping is a fraction of the price, a, a very small fraction of the price. And it's just for me to take a look at what's happening, to tell them where we can go with this, to propose what I can do next in the bigger package. So then before they commit to the bigger package, they literally just bought a product. And the way I productized it is the price is standard, the, the end result is standard, what you get is standard, my process and time is standard. So I standardized everything and I turned it into a product from my service. So instead of just taking a product and selling it, I turned my service into a product. Now that's one way of doing it with a service. If you're, if you're, let's say, whatever your practice is, if you do art consulting, if you do space, if you're an interior designer or whatever, if you do a lot of consulting, you can still turn that consulting service into products. And finally, with my teaching, because my teaching is also my practice. So I'm, I decide when the pandemic started and when I moved to London, I wasn't able to teach for several reasons. So I'm like, I'm, I still practice teaching in the way that I could. So I turned that into guides, downloadable guides, for example, um, that are about the topics that I teach or mentoring sessions, one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions or workshops, one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one workshops. And I'm currently also working on a book, basically publishing a book. So I turned my teaching practice into things that I can actually sell, um, not necessarily just for profit, but also to, to continue to teach. And if I can't teach in a classroom, I can still continue to practice teaching in other ways. So that's, that's what I meant here by product or service. And there, is, there are def different ways where, I mean, different purposes for that. You can either do it for profit, pure financial profit. Um, you need to diversify your income. Your freelance job have dried, jobs have dried up, no more exhibitions, no more whatever. And it's just for profit. And there's no harm or shame or um, guilt in turning your practice into a profitable uh, a profitable avenue. Basically, we we all we we're all practicing creatives. Yes, but that's also we have lives to uphold, and we have bills to pay, and we have basically roofs to keep over our heads. So, if your your standard and traditional source of income has dried up, then there's no shame or harm in turning, in opening up new windows that also generate more profit. And also, obviously, you can productize your service or or um, practice for recognition. Sometimes it's not just for financial gain. Sometimes it's for awards or exhibitions or, uh, or a display somewhere. So you can, you can just turn it into a, a product for that purpose. And then finally, um, it could be for personal exploration. You could be just purely exploring different aspects of your practice and that turns into something. And then you decide, you know what? I can exhibit it somewhere, I can sell it somewhere, I can, uh, a client sees it or someone sees it and they want to buy it and you approach and it's commissioned. Um, so there are several ways that you can do it. Um, I, uh, Nahla, are you, should I go yeah. on? I, uh, I appreciate what you said about Annie, this idea is that we were raised to never be jack of all trades and a master of none, you know, like th this is something that, uh, that 
that has kind of flipped and transitioned a lot in, in the last couple of years, because yes, ultimately, we are extremely multifaceted in our practices. And, um, you know, it was interesting what you said about this idea of, of your calendar not necessarily responding to the market. And one thing we have been really thinking about as we designed Fursa School was to think about the UAE market in particular and learn how to avoid areas that are you know, that are already oversaturated. And um, I guess my question to you is, what would you do in a situation like that? What, what would you have done differently in terms of understanding the market because yes of course you know we we have our ideas we we're, we're ex we take a lot of pride in in our ideas and developing them but quite often you know, pivoting to think about audience engagement for a product or a service that is prof profitable and outside of our practice has been alien to a lot of people actually and this is something that we we were very keen to hear your insight on Basically, I was at the time very attached to letterpress, and I don't know if you, if, if people are familiar with letterpress, it's just a method of printing. Um, now, letterpress wasn't available in Saudi at the time, so I had to do it in America. And that obviously brought up my price tremendously because of the technology, but also because of packaging and shipping. And I proposed the idea to a platform that used to sell pro design products in Saudi. And they told me, your price is crazy. You're not going to get away with this price. And I told them, no, I've done my research, which I have, but I've done my research with people around, like designers and people yeah. who appreciate this technology. Uh, and that was my mistake because I didn't keep my wider audience in mind. I wanted to sell to a wider audience, but yet I only did my research with a smaller audience. So it was, it was, it, not, it wasn't good research. So my price didn't reflect the audience I had intended to sell to because I thought they would appreciate letterpress and they would know why this is um, this price or why this is ex this expensive. Um, so it was purely like lack of, re lack of understanding of who my audience is, uh, but also a, a very, very uh, unhealthy attachment to the way I was thinking and the price that I thought was right. And you said that like we're always forego the letterpress, for example. I wasn't. I didn't. I, if I had done that, if I had done the if I, go, if I had basically changed the letterpress, it would have base it would have been accepted into that platform, and it would have been mass uh, sold and mass produced. It would have run out. I did some things right, so I didn't overprint. So I wasn't left with a big loss, basically. Um, I had covered my I covered my cost with the number that I sold, but I didn't cover my objective to just be mass uh, distributed and mass produced. So I get so I mean it's it's just and again a lot of these things on tri are trial and error. But I'm going to get in the last slide. I'm going to talk to you about the things that you have to absolutely avoid. <laughs> there's always going to be tri trial and error, and you're always going to learn from whatever experiences you try. But there are things that like this, like not knowing your audience is, is a mistake that no one should make because you need to be really in line with your audience. And again, it goes back to what I have on this slide. Why are you doing this? Is it for profit? Because if I was doing it for profit, I should have completely uh, moved on from letterpress, did whatever it is to sell. If I was doing it for recognition, my criteria would have been different. And if I was doing it for my own personal experience, or exploration, again, it would have been different. It all goes back to why you're doing this in the first place and what's your drive. Now, moving forward, there are a few things um, you need to remember, a, a kind of like criteria for developing products. And, and regardless, and when I say products, please remember that I mean either an actual retail product or um, a service that you turn into a product. It has to have appeal. It has to appeal to either a wide range of customers or a specific customer you have in mind. So with my calendar, what I could have done is I could have went all in targeting designers and artists instead of targeting the masses. I targeted the masses, but yet I produced a very specialized um, product. Um, so it needs to have appeal for the audience that you have in mind. Obviously it needs to be original because you you mentioned this earlier and you said oversaturated markets. We have things around us all the time from every side, from every angle, from every shop, from every online or Instagram shop. So you have to have a unique aspect, a unique design, a unique idea. It has to be original. It has to be different. There has to be something about it that I'm not necessarily never going to get because if you're designing, for example, 
a tote bag. Yes, we get a lot of tote bags around us, but what is it about yours that makes it special? Is it recycled? Does it go to charity? Is it, does it have pockets? Does it extend? There are so many things that we can think of to make it original, basically, even if it's in a category that's already there, we're not inventing the category. Uh, and obviously quality, because if it's not well-made or well-packaged or well done, then it's not gonna, you're not gonna have repeat uh, customers or repeat interest. And then finally price. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dedicate a, a good portion to, to pricing. So I'm not going to get a lot into it, but it needs to be realistically priced. I wasn't realistic in my approach. I was very, again, attached to the way I saw things happening and it was extremely uh, wrong, basically. So the next thing is the million dollar question, obviously, um, the pricing. And I thought I'd uh, talk about money. Um, Basically, there, there, uh, there I, I talk about pricing fundamentals, um, and there for for anyone in any discipline or any creative practice, there are several things that you need to know. And this is regardless of whether you're having a product or a service. If whatever you're going to turn into a profitable diversification of your income, you need to think about these three prices. First of all, you need to have a cost price, and I'm going to explain to you what a cost cost price is. Um, so let's say, um, let's say we're talking about this bottle and how the cost price is how much is it going to cost me, not materials or labor, but from my time and from my design and from my whatever overheads I have. So let's say this is my office that I'm renting. How, how much do I have to dedicate from my time in this office space to develop this product? So that's my cost. And, I, and in this calculation here, I'll give you more details about cost. And then I've, once you've developed your cost, you think about your wholesale price. So if I have my product and I want to sell it to a retailer, um, how much am I going to sell it for? What am I going to charge them to buy my product that I've developed? And then finally, you have the final retail consumer price, which is what you see on the shelf. This is what how this is priced or whatever, like what the final consumer is buying. So it might this might get a bit technical. So and I'm going to try to make it the least technical we can be, just to give you an idea, because I didn't want this talk to be very theoretical. I wanted you to actually get something out of it. Um, so in or this is the most important price you need to know, because these are just multiple, you multiply by two and you multiply by two, so it's easy to get. But in order for you to determine your cost, how much it costs you to, to produce something, and again, it could be a product or a service, it doesn't matter. First, you need to know what your overheads are. Overheads are office rent, phone bills, internet bills, anything that you have to use to produce the work that you do. Um, so in my case, um, I work in a co-working office, co-working office space. So that would go there, my monthly rent for the co-working office. It would go for my method, for my Adobe membership, uh, the price that I pay for Adobe membership, anything that I need to use to maintain my practice. So this goes here, you add it all together. If you have a yearly amount multi, uh, divided by 12, just to get monthly, monthly is easier to work with because yearly is just like a very big idea. And then the second thing that you, that you need to think about, include, sorry. sorry, does this include things like your life expenses, rent, um, uh, no, bills? Life, life expenses goes here in salary. Um, so that's what you need to make, the amount of money you need to make to cover your life expenses. And if you already have a job, and your this this product these products that you're doing are extra let's say your job pays you half of what you need um, for your life expenses and the other half you include here in this calculation um, so and your salary basically you think about everything basic living expenses but you don't put your work expenses because work expenses overheads we've already calculated them here um, so anyway, so then you add these two and you'll get your basically your monthly operating cost as a person to live, to eat, to, to have a home, to pay rent, and also as a business to my, for my software to, go, to keep going from my phone, from my internet, from my rent in my office, whatever. Obviously the less office rent or whatever you have, the less your hourly rate is. We're calculating these two to get to number three, which is our hourly rate. 
Uh, and I know a lot of people talk have, have issues with hourly rate, but I find it very helpful just to give you a ballmark of what I need, how much I need to, what is my minimum that I need to make to be able to pay rent, to be able to cover my software subscription. Like it, it just helps me to think of the minimum and then you can build on that minimum, right? So I think it's very important to determine it. Now for hourly rate, if we, we calculated the monthly from these two, if you divide it by four, you're going to get the weekly. And if you divide it by the number of hours per week, because a lot of people are not doing this full time, many times, like for, for me, I'm doing my PhD, so I can only dedicate a certain number of hours to my practice per week. So I will only charge for the certain number of hours I'm dedicating to this specific product or this specific service. So you divide it by the number of hours you can work per week, and it's going to give you your, num your hourly rate. You're going to get an amount that this is how much you charge per hour. Now, why is that important? Because if I know that I'm worth 50 pounds per hour, 50 dirhams per hour, and this product that I'm doing takes me, you, you add to it this amount of time that it takes you not to design, to, to assemble and to put it together, because design we already took into account here. We already took what it costs you to design, what my time is worth as, as a designer. But now we're talking about what this product takes how much time it takes so if it's something that i need to assemble package send out this process of assembling packaging sending out how many hours is it two hours for example then i might multiply my hourly by two hours and that's the price i have for this product that's the basic price that that's my basic cost for this product this if i cover this i've covered my cost obviously you want profit so that's not the only thing we're thinking about which takes me to point number four that's where you add your material, and that's only you as a designer, that's only your time, which is one mistake that a lot of people do, is that they forget to calculate their time into the price. They only do this part here. They only look at material cost and marketing cost and whatever, and that's what they charge. But they've spent countless hours developing it and they don't charge for that part. So that's you, that's the time it took from you. You add to this number here, your material cost, however, and that's something you don't control, basically, whatever materials you find. And I like to add, to, I don't, I, I didn't come up with this formula, but like the, you add to it a contingency as well. Contingencies is good, and it's roughly a 10%. It's just a buffer, basically. And that buffer helps you for two reasons. If you have emergencies, if, for example, you, you, your material for some reason just went up, um, you ended up working more hours than you expected. So it's good to have that safety net. But also it's good because um, if, you, if you need to, um, it's good also if you need to uh, offer discounts. So then you can offer your customers discounts because you have this contingency safety blanket. I don't necessarily use them for discounts. I use them for emergencies and you do get emergencies, delays, expensive materials, uh, more time to develop something. The packaging that you had in mind is no longer available and you have to buy a more expensive one. So it's just a safety net that protects you. Now, once you have this cost, once you have this total number, you go back to this formula of, sorry, you go back to this and you determine your wholesale price and your retail and consumer price. If I have my cost price, let's say it's 100 dirhams per product because I've calculated it based on this, you generally sell it to wholesale uh, for one, uh, um, for two times the cost. So if it costs me 100 dirhams to make, I'm gonna sell it to retail, retailers for 200. And then the retailers are gonna sell it to the consumer for two times that cost because they need to cover their overheads. They need to cover their rent and their shop and their whatever, the things that and their staff and everything they have to cover. So if you determine, okay, you know what? This is the shop, I'm selling it for them for 200 they're gonna take it and possibly sell it for 400, let's assume 400, because they double it. Um, and then if you go and sell it directly to the consumers, you have to meet the retailer price. You have to also sell it for 400 because then you're ruining their business. If you're selling it directly to consumers for 200, but you have it at a retailer for 400, that sends very con contradictory messages. So you have to always match the retailer price. It's recommended. Obviously, if the retailer decide to do six times a margin, that's not realistic, but the standard margin for a retailer is from 1.5 to three times the price of wholesale. 
I know we're getting a bit technical, <laughs> but it's good to know these yeah. things because because it's very because these are things that are often neglected and we don't necessarily know how to do it or how to price it or why retailers are doing things the way they do. Um, so just think this is the most important thing you need to know, which is your cost. And it takes into consideration your time plus the product you're selling. And then you have a wholesale price for the retailers. And then the retailers have a consumer price and you generally have to meet that price. So your business doesn't contradict with the retailer if you're selling directly. Does that make sense? We do actually have a question which would be relevant to, to bring up now actually, which is what if your hourly cost calculation does not reflect the market hourly cost, cost of services? Do you your stay true? Okay. So what if your hourly cost calculation does not reflect the market hour cost, hourly cost of services? Should you stay true to your numbers or do you try to match the market? Like where is the, the balance in that? Um, I don't think you, you need to be very fixated on matching the market because the market sometimes is not necessarily reflective of reality. And our market doesn't have standards. We don't have uh, labor unions or um, bodies that determine standard pricing or that have a rationale or a solid ethical rationale for market pricing. Um, so I, I personally, I'm not really fixated on market pricing, although obviously I'm not gonna be way below or way above the market, but if I'm within the overall range, maybe slightly higher, slightly lower, I wouldn't necessarily be very fixated on market because like I said, our market is not determined by um, standardized bodies that look at costs of living, that look at uh, product mater materials or costs or whatever. It's, it's extremely arbitrary and extremely random. And that's based on research. I've, when I first started working, um, I've asked every single entity, professional or personal uh, designers who I'm working with and their pricing rationales was, were completely personal completely based on their personal circumstances. So I would be more concerned with determining your cost and your what makes sense to you. And if it is lower than the market, let it be lower. And if it's way higher, um, you need to just be able to justify it. I'm honestly a very firm believer in you being comfortable with your rationale, you being comfortable with how you price, you being able to justify it if you have to justify it, to explain it, if you have to explain it. But then that's it. The market is not necessarily an indicator, especially with regards to pricing your time, the market is, or your hourly rate, the market is not necessarily a very clear indicator of what's right and what's wrong. You know, we also had a comment from the audience and we, we say this a lot that the time and our hourly price does not necessarily reflect the decades we've spent learning these things, um, getting to a point where we can produce in the efficiency that we can produce today. Yeah. And uh, another question that we have is if someone asks you to provide your product at a wholesale price, what should your profit margin percentage be? And you take into consideration other retail prices as well. Um, wholesale is generally two times the cost standard. Yeah, that's a standard formula. And again, everything I'm sharing here is general guidelines. You have to take that and apply it to the market you're in, to the industry you're in, to your competition. Um, basically, it's a bit um, general. But generally speaking, wholesale is two times your cost. Um, okay. and, and then retail is 1.5 to three times wholesale. And that's the final price that the consumer is paying. There was a second part of that question. Sorry, you said, so what's the wholesale price? And then what was the other yeah. one? So, sorry, let me just bring that back out again. Do you take into consideration other similar products, retail prices as well? Yes, uh, I'm going to talk about that towards the end. Yes, you definitely take into consideration other retail prices because you're selling in a market. You're not selling in isolation. So if you're offering a similar product uh, with similar characteristics and yet it's priced, but again, like this is a very subjective conversation because I always look at fashion as, a, as an example. You have fashion brands who have bags that do exactly what other fashion brands uh, bags do 
but yet they're priced 10 times more and 10 times more expensive uh, because they've built a name, they've built a clientele, they've built a brand, they've built a history. So I think it's extremely subjective to say that I have to do what others are doing. Um, you don't necessarily have to do that, but it's part of the research process to be able to see where everything is, where you are, to place yourself. It's all about positioning yourself well. But if you choose to position yourself as more expensive, more premium, that's something you chose to do and there's no harm in that, but you have to justify it and explain it because you will be asked and you will be asked to explain it. Um, so I don't necessarily think we have to be very tied down to the mold and we have to all fit the same mold. It doesn't work like that, especially when we're talking about turning our practices into products. Uh, but you definitely have to yourself understand your rationale and have a rationale uh, and not just randomly decide, you know what, this is what I'm gonna price. So Dana, do you, do you almost have something that you can apply? We're getting the comment again about this idea of the hourly rate not necessarily applying to those who are more efficient because they spent years of practice getting to that point. And how do you add value or how do you, like, is there a percentage you would add to the value of the years you've spent investing in you? That's a very tricky question because if you're selling something, um, if you're selling a product, you have to build a track record. That investment that you've done on yourself is not something that people can see necessarily. What they can see is a track record or our, our, our years of experience. I mean, my pricing formula for non-retail uh, or like non-productized services does take into consideration, um, what do I call it? The value factor. And by value factor, I put into I put into it my experience, the years I've had um, in the market. I put into it the reach or the the engagement that this product or thing is going to have. But that's a very uh, uh, an in depth conversation, and it's extremely subjective because there are several views that either support or contradict that method. I would the one thing I would say is. Um, you can, I wouldn't necessarily think your hourly rate would change because your overheads and your salary doesn't change. Now your salary can change because you think for the experience you have, for the amount of time you've developed, maybe you need a higher salary or maybe you can add a, a, a third criteria in addition to salary that takes into account the value that you bring into this or the experience that you bring into this. But it doesn't change your hourly cost of operation. Um, and maybe, and maybe you, you, you developed your hourly cost of operation and then you decide, you know what, I don't want to multiply that by two. Two is very small of a number for me. I want to multiply that by five. No one can tell you it's wrong because it's a choice that you're making based on what you know you, know you bring into the table. But these, these numbers or these uh, multiplica multiplications I'm, I'm, I'm adding here are just the standard practice. And again, there's always standard practice and there are people who don't follow the standard practice. You decide where you want to position yourself. So in terms of um, the general, like, these are just general tips of what I think uh, relevant to pricing. Um, the most mistakes I, uh, I've, I see uh, happening around me is people either charge too little or charge too much. Um, and too little and too much, again, are very subjective based on the market that you operate. And then, like I said, I wouldn't necessarily be too attached to the market, but I would definitely just keep it in mind because, and especially if you want to position yourself as relevant to the market. And like I said, fashion is a very good example of brands that don't necessarily fit the market. You can get a white t-shirt from a brand for a certain price and you can get a white t-shirt from another brand for 10 times that price and people will still buy it. It's just a matter of how you market it and how you position it and how you justify that price. And sometimes it's not even justified, but sometimes you position it in a way that says, this is how I value my time. This is how I value what I have to offer. And, but I, I wouldn't recommend just I mean, I'm just using fashion as an example, but I wouldn't recommend um, following their footsteps. Because again, I, I personally believe in very clear and ethical pricing. And, and I believe in being able to justify your price and having it make sense to you, but also make sense to your consumer. So I don't like these vague and random uh, rationales. I like very clean and 
simple rationales. And that's why I work with formulas and I work with numbers just to be able to be comfortable with it. The other thing I like, I, I, I've already mentioned is a lot of people don't charge for their time. And I think it's worth charging for your time. And for that question about your experience and value, you can always add that to your formula. If you feel like you have invested in experience so much and that should come into your pricing, charge for your experience and your, and your, um, and your uh, basically what led you to that place. And also, also consider where you are in terms of the market that you're in but also consider where you are in, in your career. Because if you're just starting out and if this is just your first uh, product or your first venture, uh, it wouldn't make sense to position yourself as extremely expensive, extremely unaffordable, extremely um, exclusive. Again, that's only if you want that positioning. But if you're just starting out, I would recommend you test. You grow slowly and you grow organically as opposed to just um, trying to go in too fast, too strong. Um, and then obviously we got the question about the market. You have to obviously study the market and the competition to see what they're doing and to see where you want to position yourself. But by no means are you restricted to just follow that standard. It is the logical approach. It is the approach that I would recommend, but you don't necessarily have to follow it to the T. If you have done your calculations and you're slightly above or slightly below, that's not an issue. Um, as long as you're comfortable with where you stand. And then my final tips um, is basically, um, I've, I've, like I've briefly mentioned it, is to try to grow organically. I've seen a lot of people try to grow too fast. Uh, I'm one of those people, I'm very impatient. My, I am personally very impatient. So I'd like to see things and seeing, see them happening quickly. So I would suggest you start small, test the market, and then decide where your place is and how you want to grow. Also find a balance between what the market needs and what you do best. And like I said, my own mistakes is that I didn't know my customers. I didn't keep them in mind. I knew them, but I didn't keep them in mind when I was designing. Uh, and I didn't really think about my unique selling proposition, which is the USP. Uh, what makes me better, different, uh, more advanced, more um, generally, uh, different than others? Is this a product that is handmade? Is it recycled? Is it for charity? Is it for, is it part of a range? It's not a one-off product. What makes it special? And then finally, the one thing I really like need to, uh, really need to mention is being professional. And by professional, I mean, from your first interaction, every single step of communication with your prospective audience, where they find you, uh, what marketing channels you use, um, how you develop your branding, your naming, your identity, your pricing, your invoicing, everything needs to be professional and planned, not just decided as you go along. So if you decide to extend into diversifying, it really needs to be planned prior to actually doing it. And I've included here a few examples of some art products, and I'm not necessarily saying these are the only ways that obviously that can be done, but there's, um, you can venture into products as in jewelry, uh, clothing, um, the, these are socks, bags, uh, whatever it is that your practice looks like, whether it's illustration, whether it's typography, whether it's uh, drawing, whether it's painting and art, these are prints, um, it could be on ceramics, it could be in homeware, this is a towel, <laughs> um, uh, these are pins and coasters, so it, you could, find an industry that you, or a, or a pr product category that you like, and then you can find your practice in it. And I'm not saying no one has done it. Obviously we see uh, cups and mugs and, and, and things everywhere, but I honestly believe that we need to see more uh, well-designed and well-done things. So if I'm drinking from a, mug, from a mug, why does it have to be plain if I can get something that really just makes me look better, uh, makes me feel better and it looks better. So I'm not saying we necessarily have to invent product categories, but we can make existing product categories um, look better. And that's it. Thank you so much, Dana. Uh, this, this was fantastic and enlightening. And thank you so much for compressing this information into uh, um, an hour. I, 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 Dana, I think we went over time a little, right? Or no? We're good? Uh, well, we, we may just about do that because we have quite a few questions from the audience. Uh, Dana will also be sharing a toolkit uh, of information that will be available for all of you as well. 
So I'm going to just uh, go down through these questions. So does the formula change when we do consignment work? So for example, when some stores take 40%, mm. how, how I think can consignment you work that? is different because consignment, you're working with someone else's criteria and you're working with someone else's um, rationale. So you have to take it into account, but but what doesn't change is not you, the formula, the, the cost doesn't change because your time, how much your time is worth, what your salary is, what your overheads are, um, how many times per week do you want to work does not change. So your cost doesn't change. Now, the 40% that they're adding, oh, you mean consignment, sorry. So when you're, um, no, I don't think the formula, your formula changes. That's so, for example, I'll give you my example. When I do workshops on my own, uh, I'm releasing them through my website. Obviously, 100% uh, comes back to me and my formula doesn't change. Now, when I'm doing it with other uh, outlets, I'm doing it through people, they do take their percentage out of it. But my formula doesn't change because my end price, the way I position myself is this amount for this workshop. Now, whether this amount goes directly to me or whether I have to share it with someone, the end user, the consumer is still used to being my pro to my product being within this price range. So that's something you have to basically work out. But what I recommend you do is diversify. Don't necessarily always do through consignment because that eats up from your end result. I would have through consignment and through direct channels. So you get to at least balance both. Absolutely. And I think uh, the scary thing about consignment is this idea that you need to invest in the product, knowing that it might be sold, it might not be sold, right? So then it's completely in their hands to, to drive traffic towards this thing being sold. In a case like that, can you negotiate, for example, a deposit and a down payment that goes into support of uh, producing your product to yes. begin with. So can, for example, the hosting institution or shop cover those costs and then take yep. that out later? Yes, 100%, because you're not supposed to carry the risk on your own, especially if this is a collaborative product, you're starting off with a someone, with a partner, they should definitely carry some weight of the risk. And also like it's common practice outside of our region to, to have a certain... Uh, um, to have a contract for a certain number, whether it sells or not, you're paid for it. Um, so like a prepayment plan, that happens also. Mm -hmm. So the store, for example, let's say you're working with a store, they buy 50 pieces because from their, no, from their research, they know they can sell it, but you're not liable and you're not responsible to, be, to uh, make sure they sell it. You get paid for your work, you get paid, paid for your product and the selling is on them. And if they lose and if they don't sell, then they can do discounts, they can, then they can do bundles, then they can do whatever they want to do with it because your effort has been um, covered. That happens as well. We don't see it happening a lot in our part of the world, but that happens and I, and that's what I mean by professional or common practice being very subjective in our part of the world, but it doesn't mean that it's right. You can start to apply these practices with this with this batch of designers and artists. They can start to apply proper practices and then the market will catch up and the industry will catch up because you're not recreating something. You're not inventing something. You're just applying proper uh, industry practices. Um, so you can definitely ask for a down payment and I think you should because you could, shouldn't carry the risk on your own. But also some do ask for full payment and the sales is out of their uh, responsibility, basically. We have another question about the fear of something being um, not appreciated because it's handmade. What are ways that you could enhance that or actually make that an, an asset to your product? Um, I think it's all about marketing and positioning and the way you position it. I, uh, I, I, and I've never really, the quality, sorry, the finishing, the quality exactly. as well. Exactly. Yeah. I've, I actually, I actually happen to think that handmade and, and, uh, hand developed is actually more, um, appreciated than mass produced. But, it, but there might be this negative connotation to handmade being lower quality. So you're right. If handmade is of equal quality to something that is mass produced, it actually makes it more, more special and more unique because it's 
individually made by a person, not by a machine that operates in other parts, you know what I mean? But I think it's just, a, it's just going around that negative connotation of handmade being lower quality. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm going to combine the two final questions. They're very similar. So can you give an example of what would be too low or too high as a price point? And how do you go from a customer profile to a valid price point for the product? Or rather, how do you plan your marketing and outreach based on the selling price you have calculated? I think all of these questions are driven driven by one thing. You have to know your audience. You have to know who you're selling for. If you're selling for a shop, if you're selling for a person, if you're selling for a, a, a sector, um, who are they? How much do they usually spend? Where do they spend? Where do they buy? Um, I can't give you a price range that is high or too low because that's a very general question. It all depends on what you're selling and who you're selling it for. Um, but the number one step is to really study your audience and to really study the product that you're selling. These are the two pillars. This is my audience and this is what I'm selling. And how, where, if there's a disconnect between how I'm pricing and what they usually pay or what is usually how this product is usually priced, then I need to decide on where I'm going to position myself. And like I said, you can decide to position yourself at the premium rate or the lower end rate. That's a choice that you can make. That's a beauty of a diversified market. That's a beauty of a competitive market. We don't all have to fit the same mold but you have to be driven by your research about your market and the product and the industry you're in. So unfortunately we can only take one more question. I know we've received uh, a larger number of questions, but we have just a few minutes before the webinar ends. Um, I want to bring to your t attention one more, which is, from a painter point of view, when pricing for live art against pricing for original paintings, and that being a challenge, what is the best advice to create a formula for a painting versus live art? So live art could be performance versus painting. I think it's, look, we're, we're thinking about your time. So the, so the things that I have in this formula here, the overhead, the sad, these things don't change whether you're, doing a painting or a live performance or whatever it is, the background work is the same. Now the execution is different. Or like when I when I said, add the factor of how long it's gonna take you to package it. So if you're doing a live performance, instead of packaging and assembling it, how long is it gonna take you to get there? How much time you're gonna spend there? Um, how much time is it gonna get you to get back from there? Like the actual time that you're gonna spend going to and from that live performance becomes a part of your formula as opposed to assembly and packaging. So you just take it and adjust it to what you're doing, but the underlying principle remains the same. The underlying principle of how much my time is worth, how much do I need to make to cover my cost of living? How much do I need to make to cover to my cost of business? That remains the same, but you add to it the different ways of executing the extra time that you need. So if a person who is doing a product needs two hours to package and assemble, someone who is doing a performance needs three days maybe five hours a day. So that's 15 hours as opposed to two hours. And they, they take that into consideration. Dana, we're about to end our webinar. Yeah. But we, <laughs> hey, thank you so, so much for your time. This was invaluable and a lesson to all of us. Uh, Dana has shared her Instagram, um, her handle, her feed and, and everything else. So please, um, Feel free to, to carry out this conversation with Dana. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for attending. I'm sorry I had to cram everything in the hour that we had, but I'll always reach out if you need to know more. Um, I'm always ready to help. Thank you so much, Dana. Yeah, let's talk soon. Take care. Bye.